All right. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Gloria. I'm here with the GetCoin Events team. Uh, I'm here from the GetCoin Events team. I'm here with Kevin from Moonbeam. And uh, before we get started, I wanted to take care of some housekeeping. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the session's being recorded, so you'll be able to watch this session on the on the GetCoin uh, YouTube channel. I think you just went on mute. Yeah, I forgot I had YouTube playing in the back. <laughs> so speaking of YouTube, I'll be monitoring YouTube. Uh, I'll be monitoring the questions there. If you have any questions, throw it on in the chat. Uh, if you have questions here on Airmeet, you can throw it on in the chat in the Q or the q and I'll go ahead and monitor both. Uh, and last but not least, feel free to say hi in the chat. Uh, let us know where you're watching from and what you're working on. It's a great way for us to get to know all of y'all. And it's a good way for y'all to get to know one another. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Kevin, and Kevin, feel free to start it. Thank you so much, Gloria. And uh, uh, if this is the first workshop you're you're joining us for, uh, welcome. If you're a return visitor, uh, a very warm welcome uh, as well. So we had a wormhole uh, first thing this week, uh, followed up by a hyperlane. This is just uh, you know a, a subset of our workshops. So uh, Moonbeam uh, is today, and then next week we will have. Uh, not only Axelar on Monday, uh, but Tuesday we will have layer zero. Uh, so there's lots of content ahead. And of course, if you missed any of the sessions, uh, that's no problem at all. They are available on the Gitcoin YouTube. They will also be republished on uh, Moonbeam's YouTube. Um, but right now we have uh, lots of uh, conference replays uh, from last Thursday and Friday uh, from the uh, Illuminate conference that was that was streamed. So. Uh, Need to need to uh, uh, wait a day or two for for those videos. Um, I think before we we upload uh, additional ones. Uh, so today, uh, uh, today I'm very excited to talk to you about connected contracts. And what I'd like to do is kind of make this session a a hybrid of of what are connected contracts. You know, why are we looking into and why are we building and and so excited about um, sharing with you uh, and encouraging you to build uh, connected contracts. So so kind of the what the why, and we'll also get to the how. Um, and uh, in terms of the, the how component, I have a two demos to share. Um, and then I also have a kind of like where to go next. So uh, documentation links, uh, resources, tutorials, things like that for each of the sponsors. Um, so if you want to build on Axelar, I'll show you how to get started uh, and where to go next. And if you want to build on Hyperlane, Wormhole, and Layer Zero, I'll show you uh, uh, my recommendations for the example tutorials, uh, for the uh, uh, video links, for the contract addresses, for all of that. Um, so there isn't time uh, today in this workshop to um, do a, a hands-on component for for every single uh, uh, protocol, um, but that's okay because there are workshops you know put on by each uh, sponsor, and in each of those um, there is a, a hands-on component. So. Uh, let's let's first talk about the what, uh, the what and the why. So you may have heard us talk uh, about the future being multi-chain uh, before. You've heard that uh, that phrase go around, and um, it's a pretty popular uh, uh, belief right now. And uh, why is it so popular? Um, so there are there are a number of reasons. Uh, for one, there are an increasing uh, number of users coming into uh, the space. There. Is increasing demand for specialization of blockchains, um, specialization of, of apps, and also specialization of of, of apps and uh, teams kind of demanding their their own chains. So, the idea being, if you have a um, a regular uh, DeFi application, let's say uh, where your users are regularly making transactions uh, on a particular chain, that you share uh, with a very hyped NFT mint, right? And let's say the NFT mint, uh, you know, essentially uh, uh, has a, a huge number of transactions in a in a very short period of time. Um, that could maybe result in a degraded experience uh, for your users uh, because you're you're sharing this chain. And so, uh, some people have have moved to create kind of uh, uh, whether it's a layer two or whether it's a specialized chain uh, for a particular app or a game. That's certainly a possibility. So chains are specializing, um, and Polkadot naturally um, is very well suited for this specialization. 
uh, Polkadot makes it easy for you to launch a new substrate based chain. They provide a lot of the groundwork out of the box. So networking, shared security, um, coordination of who gets to actually run a, a parachain. Um, and then of course, XEM connectivity to other chains within Polkadot. So Polkadot takes care of, of a lot of that. So you can focus uh, on the fun part um, and, and the primary component, which is uh, building your uh, building your chain and, and your community, uh, figuring out what apps that you need on it and things of, of that sort. Um, and the last part here is a, a scaling component. So uh, the world is, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not just layer ones, there's also layer twos. Um, and so an increasing number of chains uh, is, is helping to kind of uh, handle uh, increasing, you know, transaction throughput um, and additional demand for, for block space. Um, so these are kind of a bunch of reasons why we think that the future is multi-chain. And uh, when we think about the multi-chain, uh, you know, future, it's helpful to kind of think about where we've been, you know, what does it look like uh, to date, right? And then we can kind of talk about where we're going. So to date, um, the two major multi-chain approaches have been one, to have a centralized deployment model. Um, and this is pretty typical. This is pretty standard uh, for the last couple of years. The idea here is that you pick a chain, um, you announce to all your users, say, hey, we're here on this particular chain, come find us. They may need to bridge in. They may uh, <clears throat> not have the native token uh, to pay for gas. So they may need to go to a centralized exchange. They may need to do a gasless swap to get that token. Um, and if they're lucky, maybe they're already on that chain uh, to begin with. So the good about a centralized deployment, you have one deployment to maintain. Um, and so that is, you know, straightforward. Uh, but the bad is apparent, and uh, that's that you're limiting your users. You're segmenting them to a particular chain, and you're asking them to to bridge in. Um, <clears throat> and some users may not be comfortable with that. And so very quickly, we have kind of evolved to this multi-instance deployment. And when I say we, I mean the entire Web3 ecosystem has kind of um, approached this uh, multi-instance deployment model. And that would be to say, we're going to take the exact same smart contract and we're going to deploy it to many different chains. So we're going to make, uh, if you have a DeFi application, you're going to make it available on layer twos. You're going to make it available on uh, a variety of EVM compatible chains, let's say. And you may access this application through the same front end. You may go to the same website and you may just change the button in the upper right hand corner for a different network. So the experience can feel you know, somewhat connected but make no mistake, uh, these different deployments, they know nothing about each other. They're not benefiting from the presence of each other. Um, and the liquidity is being fragmented across all of these different chains. So while this is uh, you know, advantageous over having you know, one single deployment, um, you're, you're fragmenting your liquidity across all these different chains. You're adding additional complexity because now instead of maintaining one or two uh, deployments you're now maintaining, you know, many, many, uh, you know, perhaps a dozen different deployments. Um, and so it's not hard to see these types of, of drawbacks within a, a multi-instance multi deployment uh, uh, model. Um, but there is a, another way, uh, there is another approach to take. And uh, before I introduce that, I'll just talk a little bit about Polkadot and how does that fit into this multi-chain world. So Polkadot, as you know, started in about uh, 2015, 2016. Um, and back in 2016, the idea that the future was multi-chain um, was very controversial, right? That was something you, you just did not hear. It was not a popular belief. Uh, but because Polkadot had that idea early on, uh, you know, the founding team was able to have such an advantage in building this layer zero and uh, pushing forward the multi-chain future. So the idea behind Polkadot uh, is that there are many best blockchains. Um, there are some that are going to specialize in gaming, some that are going to specialize in privacy. Others are going to specialize in connected contracts. Others are going to specialize in, uh, you know, uh, bridges and things uh, of the like. So Polkadot focus on, let's just find a way to connect all of these chains together, right? Polkadot is layer zero. It's not just 
to allow these independent chains to, to live on it and kind of each be their own happy little island. No, no, no. The idea is that each layer one that's deployed onto Polkadot um, talks to the other layer ones on Polkadot and benefits from the features and the services that they each have to offer. And so Polkadot enables that through XCM, uh, which is Polkadot's version of general message passing. We won't be talking too much about XCM today. We'll be mostly focusing on general message passing uh, between Moonbeam and other ecosystems like Ethereum, Avalanche, uh, and uh, uh, you know Phantom and, and other ecosystems like that. So of course, the idea behind Polkadot is that uh, you don't just have a bunch of separate chains, but instead you have an ecosystem of connected chains that can talk to one another um, and that are mu mutually uh, beneficial to each other. Um, and the idea is that you, uh, by doing this, you create an ecosystem that's greater than just the sum of the parts. Uh, so where do connected contracts fit in all this? Well, Moonbeam is a hub for you to be able to access uh, contracts features, and functionality across many different chains. Um, and how does Moonbeam do that? Well, one, uh, through Moonbeam's uh, connections to other chains within Polkadot, so that would be enabled via XEM. And secondly, through Moonbeam's connections to other ecosystems enabled by general message passing. So this is where Axtelar, Hyperlane, Wormhole, and Layer Zero come in as general message passing uh, providers. They enable Moonbeam to talk to Ethereum to talk to Cosmos, to talk to Avalanche, um, and not just to send messages, but to be able to call contracts on these other chains. So the idea being that you're on Moonbeam and you want to call a contract on Ethereum. Uh, that is now entirely possible. Uh, and you can do that uh, with Axlar, Hyperlane, Layer 0, and Wormhole. You can do that just like you would call a normal contract on Moonbeam. Uh, there's really not that much difference. Uh, and calling a contract on a remote chain versus the current chain that you're on. The only thing that you're going to be doing, uh, which is you know, perhaps just slightly more complex, is you're going to be specifying. It, it's really it's not any more complex than, than calling a contract on the native chain. You're going to be specifying a destination chain. So what chain do you want to interact with? What's the contract address on that chain? And then what's the payload that you want to provide to that? So if I want to make a swap, for example, um, on Ethereum, uh, and I'm on Moonbeam right now, uh, then I would be providing, you know, the the payload that I'd be providing would be the exact same payload that I would provide if I was, you know, on Ethereum. I would say I want to trade, um, I want to swap, you know, X asset for Y asset. You know, here's the deadline. Here are the uh, various parameters um, in in order to to execute that swap. Now you still have to meet, you know, the requirements. You have to meet the deadline. You have to meet. You have to have the, the funds to swap, um, and you do have to pay for gas. And when I say pay for gas, um, with most of the GMP protocols, you are uh, paying for gas uh, on the origin chain. Uh, meaning, uh, when you execute this first transaction on Moonbeam, so you'll pay normally for that first one, uh, and you'll also provide a little bit more so that the GMP protocol. Uh, can pay for that transaction uh, to be relayed on the destination chain. In the case of Hyperlane, um, Hyperlane is, is subsidizing uh, transactions right now, um, so you don't need to worry about gas at the moment with Hyperlane, but they are introducing um, features that will allow you to, to pay for, for gas there. Um, and yeah, it's very simple. Uh, and lastly, the, the last parameter, uh, aside from having a, a, a payload is you might provide a gas refund address. Let's say you uh, provide a little bit more gas than you needed uh, and you want it to be refunded, uh, but that's typically optional. Okay, so moving right along. Um, how does Moonbeam support connected contracts? Um, so there are uh, many different reasons here, uh, but one is that Moonbeam is an Ethereum compatible environment. Um, so it's very easy for you to launch your Solidity smart contracts uh, just as you would launch them in Moonbeam, just as you deploy them to, to Polygon, for example, uh, you can launch them in Moonbeam. And as I mentioned, Moonbeam has connectivity to a variety of different ecosystems. So for one, uh, it has uh, connectivity to, to Polkadot and to other parachains within Polkadot. And for two, uh, it has access to ecosystems outside of Polkadot. So that would be the ones 
uh, enabled by uh, GMP protocols. Um, and so that'd be ecosystems like Ethereum, Avalanche, Cosmos, uh, and more. And not just that, but uh, Moonbeam has all these different integrations that you come to expect uh, with, uh, with Ethereum. So Hardhat, uh, Truffle, Ethers.js, Web3.js, all the different uh, tools that you're used to uh, building and working with, Open Zeppelin, um, MetaMask, I, I can keep naming them, but uh, they all work with Moonbeam, which means that your development experience um, is going to be very familiar if you're coming from Ethereum. Uh, and if you're a brand new Web3 dev, um, it's also going to be a great experience because a lot of the resources that are written on Stack Exchange or forums or various tutorials, they're all written uh, with uh, the idea of a, a Solidity developer you know, on Ethereum. They're written with that in mind. Um, and so that means that they're perfectly relevant on Moonbeam as well, uh, which is awesome. And finally here, um, the last uh, uh, component is that you can scale your uh, your project in a in a very structured manner, right? So you may start, you know, as an application on Moonbeam, and if you grow big enough, then you might say, "Hey, we want to have our our own parachain, right? We want to run our own uh, uh, layer one blockchain." And there are very um, uh, direct, you know, ways that that you can do that, and you can scale uh, within the Polkadot ecosystem. So there's room for you to grow here, and of course. Launching a new chain, launching a parachain or a para thread, uh, all of that <clears throat> is uh, um, is quite straightforward, you know, within uh, within Polkadot. There there are tools that you know make it uh, more straightforward for you to do this, um, and and Substrate you know makes it uh, uh, straightforward to to launch a new chain. So um, I mentioned that XEM is Polkadot's general message uh, passing protocol. And we have uh, a ton of content on XCM. Uh, so what does uh, a GMP allow you to do, or general message passing? So I mentioned that it allows you to call a contract on a remote chain. Uh, and more specifically, it allows you to send a message to a remote chain. So in this message, you might encode a payload, uh, which includes things like which contract you want to interact with, um, what is the payload that you want to provide, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and general message passing is absolutely a revolutionary um, invention and critical to the future of blockchain interoperability. So GMP is what enables this future of connected contracts. And uh, I'll speak briefly about kind of this, this model of, uh, of connected contracts. And there are, there are two potential models. There may be more, um, but these are kind of the two main ones um, at this point. One is a hub and spoke model. And so the idea here is that you have the brains of your smart contract deployed to Moonbeam. Uh, and then you have a simpler logic uh, deployed out to satellite chains. So the example here um, is one that I'll be discussing with Prime Protocol in just a couple of slides. Um, but the idea is, uh, let's say you're, uh, if you have a, a lending and borrowing protocol that's multi-chain, you might uh, maintain uh, a user's collateral on remote chains. So let's say uh, you have remote chains, uh, Ethereum, Avalanche, and Cosmos. You can have uh, native tokens uh, on all of those chains. Users can deposit them into uh, satellite contracts. So these could be very simple contracts that are just you know, deposit, withdraw, and uh, a couple other actions like uh, perhaps take a liquidation action or like freeze the contract or something like that. Um, and then all of the brains and logic, all of that would take place on Moonbeam. So the smart contract on Moonbeam would make the liquidation decision. It would make the decision that, uh, uh, well, first it allows the user to borrow on Moonbeam, but it also uh, determines how much the user can borrow uh, based on uh, observed collateral on these other chains. And if there was a liquidation event or something that needed uh, to take place, Moonbeam can send a message to that remote chain. And then that message would contain instructions that would be delivered uh, to the uh, satellite smart contract, uh, whether it's a, a partial or a complete liquidation. Um, and I'll talk more about this example, so I'll, I'll leave it right there. Uh, that's kind of the hub and spoke model. The point-to-point -point model um, is a bit different. And that's something where uh, 
you're connected to a, a bunch of different chains, but uh, you don't have a, a hub and spoke model. So instead of going from kind of Moonbeam connected to all the other chains, you might have a message that's sent from one chain to another. So you might go from Moonbeam to Ethereum to Avalanche to Cosmos. And so these chains uh, you know, are aware uh, of each other. Um, and it's just a, a different uh, type of architecture here. So I want to give a few examples of connected contracts and uh, starting from kind of like early examples and, and moving on to more recent ones. So um, Lido's liquid staking uh, was actually one of the, the first uh, to launch uh, on one of the first connected contracts, you know, to really launch uh, on Moonbeam. And uh, Lido, you may be familiar with, they have a staked ETH product. So um, on Ethereum right now, if you if you lock up your ETH in uh, ETH's native staking, uh, it's locked indefinitely, and uh, you can't do anything with it while it's while it's staked. Uh, you cannot take it out. You can't put it in DeFi. You can't do anything like that. So, Lido came up with this idea for a uh, a liquid uh, uh, derivative uh, product where you stake with Lido, and they will give you a Lido staked ETH in return, um, which you can then go and put in DeFi. You can then go and swap it. You can do a variety of things uh, with this representation uh, that you get for um, staking your ETH. So you, you gain liquidity. That's one of the biggest things. So Lido wanted to produce a similar product uh, for the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, not because your, your Polkadot is, is locked up indefinitely, uh, but because Polkadot does have an unbonding period, uh, I believe about 27 days, uh, maybe it's 21 days. Um, I think it's 27. And so perhaps uh, you want to have instant liquidity, right? And Lido enables this. Um, but because you cannot have a, a smart contract directly deployed to Polkadot, uh, that's where Moonbeam fit in uh, as a place to make this possible. And so you can take your dot and you can move it to Moonbeam as XC dot, which is an XC20. And an XC20 uh, is just like an ERC20 token, uh, but it is uh, transferable via XCM. So you have this XC20 and uh, it's called XC dot. And then you deposit it into Lido's smart contract on Moonbeam. And what that smart contract will do is it will take your XC dot and it will take it back up to the Polkadot relay chain and it will stake it for you. Um, so we have an XCM transfer happening here. And then we have this remote action taking place on the relay chain. This is quite powerful. Um, this is something that's happening in a trustless manner. It's not the case that there's some sort of uh, off chain, somebody has to manually go and stake it and pick a validator. No, all this is happening in a trustless manner. It's all happening via XCM, uh, which is very, very cool. Um, so that was kind of the first example. Um, a, another example, a more recent one, is Prime Protocol. And this is one of my favorite uh, applications. They just launched their testnet, and I do have a demo to share with you right after this. Uh, so I'm very excited to, to show you. Uh, Prime Protocol is working on creating a DeFi uh, Prime brokerage. And you can think of it like a, a lending and borrowing protocol that's multi-chain. And uh, kind of some of the, the major advantages here. Um, I'll, I'll speak briefly about what a, a Prime broker is uh, in the Web2 sense, and then that might make a bit more sense uh, in the Web3 sense uh, as well. So uh, with, a, with the traditional bank, right? Um, a, a prime broker is somebody who maintains uh, custody of a variety of different types of assets um, and then provides bundled services to you as a VIP client. So the idea being, uh, let's say you have stocks and bonds and maybe you have uh, some real estate mortgages or various different um, uh, assets. And so your prime broker holds on to this. Um, and then you say to the prime broker, hey, I'd like to take out a loan. And the prime broker says, yeah, no problem. You have all these assets with us. We'd be more than happy to give you a loan. Um, now, in traditional borrowing and lending uh, on uh, a Web3 protocol, uh, you typically have to be on the same chain uh, as the, you typically have to deposit collateral on the same chain uh, that you want to make your, your loan on or, or borrow funds on. So let's say that you'd like to take out a loan uh, of Glimmer. Um, typically, you'd have to deposit collateral then on Moonbeam. And this collateral uh, is typically limited in that you need to, let's say you want to uh, deposit ETH as collateral. Um, you'd first have to take your native ETH 
from Ethereum. You'd have to bridge it to Moonbeam, and then you'd have to deposit it um, as collateral on Moonbeam. But what if there was a way if you could keep your native Ethereum on the Ethereum network, um, and you didn't have to bridge it over uh, to Moonbeam? So that's exactly what Prime is allowing you to do. You can keep your native assets on the original chain, and you can deposit them into these satellite smart contracts. Prime Protocol will recognize the deposit, and the brains on Moonbeam will uh, determine uh, exactly how much you can borrow. And you're not limited to just depositing like one type of asset as collateral. This opens up a breadth of new asset possibilities. Uh, right now on Testnet, there's uh, Ethereum, there's Avalanche, there's Phantom. I think Polygon's coming soon. Um, and there's a bunch of, of assets. So we'll show that in, in just a second. Um, why is this such a big deal? Um, well, for one reason, um, you're keeping your funds uh, on the native chain, uh, which uh, is safer. Um, it's less complex for a user. There's no, there's no bridging step involved. Um, <clears throat> and when we think about uh, uh, smart contract security, instead of having a bunch of funds in a giant bridge contract, um, you know, how many different DeFi protocols are there? There's there's dozens, hundreds. Uh, you know, there's going to be thousands of DeFi protocols. So instead of having one giant bridge with all these wrapped assets, uh, which is a honeypot, instead you have these funds scattered across uh, uh, different DeFi uh, uh, contracts instead of in a bridge contract. So that is uh, sig significantly safer. Um, and another thing is that you can use more assets as collateral. And if you can use more assets as collateral, you are a safer borrower. Uh, just like a prime broker in real life, they're much happier when they see this, this variety of assets. They see you have stocks, you have bonds, you have a house, you have all this. They're very happy to give you a loan. Um, whereas if you just had one concentrated position of, of Bitcoin, um, that's riskier, right? If Bitcoin suddenly tanks, uh, you have to make these liquidation decisions quickly and you're taking on more risk. So you can give a borrower a better rate um, when they have these, these multiple varieties of, of assets. And so you get a better rate. It's a better user experience. It's a better deal. It's safer for the lender, safer for the borrower. Everybody's happier. This is a uh, revolutionary improvement um, in uh, multi-chain uh, prime brokerage and multi-chain lending and borrowing. It's very, very cool. And uh, I'm very happy to go ahead and uh, uh, demo the testnet. Um, so if you want to follow along, you can go to app.primeprotocol.xyz. And I want to make sure that I'm still sharing my screen, uh, which I am. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. OK, and the first thing that we'll do is we'll just connect to our wallet. And I'm going to select MetaMask. And I'll zoom in just, just to, OK, I think that's it in terms of zoom. OK, uh, so I'm on testnet. And I before this workshop, I funded a couple of different uh, testnet accounts on various chains. So you can see I have uh, a balance of five FTM. I have a balance of two testnet AVAX. And um, that will be enough uh, to, to demo. Uh, so what I'm going to do is. Uh, let's see, my MetaMask is currently on the Phantom Network. Um, I've got my, my testnet balance here. What I'd like to do is I'd like to deposit that Phantom into Prime Protocol. So I'm on the Phantom Network. Let's go ahead and deposit um, everything that I have here. So I'll press Deposit. And I get a MetaMask pop-up, which you, you may not be able to see. Um, but actually, there's an important thing to point out here. So I just chose a, a max deposit, uh, but it was uh, rejected because uh, you need to pay for the uh, transaction. Um, you need to have a, a little bit of funds uh, for gas and a little bit of funds uh, to to pay as a fee. So let's let's try a little bit lower. We'll just we'll just try three. Um, so I'm going to press deposit three, and that'll go ahead and confirm. And we can keep track of our recent transactions here. 
and I'm going to be taking out a loan of this USP uh, for US uh, Prime Protocol uh, is a stable coin here. Um, again, this is all all test net. Um, but let's see how our transaction is doing. Did it get confirmed? Looks like it did. Yeah, it got confirmed. Cool. So this dashboard will update in just a second. And let's also deposit some funds uh, from Avalanche. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to the Avalanche network. If I press deposit, I'm pretty sure I'll be prompted to uh, to switch networks. So we'll select the network that we're depositing from. I'll be prompted to switch to it. And again, I'm going to deposit uh, not the entire amount. I press deposit. And I'll confirm the transaction. And let's tr let's check uh, on the status. So that was deposited. Everything's looking good there. Let me just give a quick refresh here and see if that updates a little bit faster. So our balances uh, should update shortly. Ah, okay, okay. Um, so let's check this status. Um, this will be a bit better. So here we go. We have our Phantom deposit, and we also have our Avalanche deposit. Um, and uh, the reason that we couldn't send the the max amount is because we had to pay for uh, gas uh, to take place on the destination chain. OK, so it looks like this one went through. Um, and you can see here that we have uh, three FTM deposited. And uh, the Avalanche one uh, should update uh, in just a second or two as well. So what have we done thus far? Uh, we've deposited our assets uh, on a remote chain. And now I want to take out a loan. So the loan that I'm going to be taking out is on Moonbeam. It's on uh, the Moonbase Alpha testnet. And uh, I can do that by going ahead and, and pressing borrow. So let's let's just recap, just a, just a quick um, uh, recap of what we've done so far. So I've deposited the FTM asset uh, on the Phantom testnet. And then uh, Prime Protocol is dispatching a message uh, back to Moonbase Alpha uh, to uh, update the, the contract and tell the brain um, you know, how much I can borrow, right? Because if I just deposit the asset on FTM um, and then Moonbase Alpha doesn't know about it, um, you know, that, that we're missing a step there. Um, so the same thing for Avalanche. I deposited the asset on Avalanche and then it's sending a message back to Moonbase Alpha saying, um, you know, hey, I've got this deposit. And so that's why we need to pay uh, a little bit extra uh, for gas in order for this transaction to take place um, on, uh, on Moonbase Alpha. So uh, there are dollar amounts assigned to these testnet funds, um, which is cool to see. And uh, let's go ahead and take out a loan. So I'm, again, I'm going to be making this loan on Moonbase Alpha. So I'm going to go ahead and press borrow. Um, I'm going to change the network to Moonbase. You'll see I was prompted to switch networks. That was very seamless. Um, I can also uh, specify the amount that I'd like to borrow. Um, and I do have a maximum amount. Um, let's just go ahead and try the max. So I'll press next. Um, it'll tell me the network that I'm taking the loan out on, the, uh, the assets. It'll tell me the borrow amount. Um, and it'll also tell me a health ratio. So what, being well over 100%, um, you know, is a is a very safe place. Uh, so if you have a health ratio of like 150, you know that's healthier than 102. Um, this is the maximum amount that I can that I can take out at this point. So my health ratio is not going to be the best. Uh, so I'll go ahead and press uh, confirm.
And uh, for the purposes of this demo, uh, right, I can't, you know, manipulate the price of these testnet assets. Um, but if it was, you know, the real world, and um, you know, either FTM or Avalanche, uh, if if the value, you know, uh, suddenly dropped, then uh, you know, I could be liquidated. My loan um, could be uh, could be my my collateral, um, you know, could be could be liquidated. Um, so let's see. So I took out the loan. Let's just see um, if we can check out this transaction here. Cool. So that transaction was successful. And now I have $14.01 uh, here as prime USP. So that was easy. Um, and that was very cool. So you are welcome to check out the Prime Protocol testnet. Um, it's app.primeprotocol.xyz. Um, I highly recommend it. They have a faucet here uh, where you can get a bunch of different types of assets. So uh, if you want to get uh, test BTC, test DAI, FRAX, um, the like, you can mint all of those and test them out. OK, so the next thing I kind of want to talk about is how Moonbeam uh, acts as a, a port of call, how it acts as a hub um, for many different types of, of assets, and how its connectivity uh, enables it uh, to do this. Um, so I spoke a little bit about XE20s, uh, but just to recap, XE20s are substrate native assets that conform to the ERC20 standard. Uh, this is a major deal uh, because it means two things. It means that you can send these substrate native assets. You can send them around to other chains within Polkadot as long as there's a, uh, a channel open. And Moonbeam strives to open channels with as many different chains uh, as we can. Um, and secondly, uh, because it's compatible with the ERC20 interface, that means that XC20s are compatible in all sorts of DeFi applications. Um, there are no changes that need to be made. Um, there is 100% uh, compatibility, um, which is very, very cool. So uh, what this means uh, is that you can take uh, assets uh, from outside of Moonbeam. Let's say uh, they're in another uh, uh, you know, EVM ecosystem. You can take them into Moonbeam. Um, you could also do something where you could take uh, another asset within Polkadot, um, such as the, the native DOT token. You can take it from the Polkadot relay chain, bring it to Moonbeam, and then you can send it out to Cosmos. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, you know, that's not something that was possible before. Uh, this type of interoperability uh, you know, is, is not something yeah, that, was, that was possible before. Uh, because Polkadot is a, is a substrate native asset. Um, it's not natively compatible uh, with the EVM. Uh, but it is once it's in the form of an XC20, uh, which is the amazing part. And then once it's in the form of the XC20, then you could take it to Cosmos, you could take it to uh, another EVM ecosystem, and you can do uh, all sorts of things with it. So what's important to, uh, uh, to think about here is that Moonbeam is this hub of many different ecosystems. Uh, it's a hub of connectivity. So I mentioned that we have all these different general message passing uh, protocols, um, which is huge because it it unlocks connectivity to many different chains. So, uh, these different uh, GMP protocols um, they have connectivity to to various different chains, and they're they're adding new chains all the time. Um, and so the the list grows longer and longer uh, of other chains that you can access. And it's not just layer ones; um, it's layer twos. Uh, it's uh, subnets, in the case of Avalanche, you can go straight uh, from a, uh, you can send a message, you know, straight from Moonbeam to a subnet. Um, you can send a message uh, to uh, various different chains, um, which is very, very cool uh, to see. Uh, and so Moonbeam is this hub of connectivity. Uh, because we are integrated with all these different uh, GMP protocols, um, you can send a message between all these different chains very, very seamlessly. OK, and why are we so interested uh, in this connected contracts uh, approach? At the end of the day, it comes down to providing a better experience for users. Uh, I'm sure you've all had the experience if you're a, a, a power user in various DeFi applications. You've had the experience where um, you have 100 different tabs open, 
and you visit a new page that, that asks for your MetaMask and it asks you to switch networks. And so you dutifully go in and press switch network. But one of your 100 other tabs that's open actually wants MetaMask instead. And so it prompts you to switch to another network. And then maybe there's a third one. And so you're constantly you know, battling to switch networks in MetaMask. It's just, it's a complicated situation. And so one of the benefits that we see with this connected contract approach is that you can take actions on all these different chains, uh, but you don't have to uh, constantly switch between chains. You can have a couple of home-based chains. You can have a chain like Moonbeam uh, where uh, you can uh, set up shop and where you can access features and functionality across many different chains. So you don't have to switch your, uh, your network a million times. You can instead be on Moonbeam and you can access features that are on all these different chains. So uh, through Moonbeam and through a GMP protocol, you can dispatch a message um, to take a swap, to buy an NFT, to uh, ask an Oracle that exists on another chain. You can do all sorts of, of things. Um, and if you were in the session yesterday, um, you heard York Rhodes talk about round trip messages um, and how Hyperland is working on um, you know, sending a message not just one way, but returning data uh, back to you in an in a attached you know, um, round trip type of message, which is really cool to see um, that they're working on. And so with this connected contracts approach, we can provide a better experience for end users. Uh, it's also allowing users to, to take actions uh, on these other chains. Perhaps um, if a chain has free space, you know they, they have lots of empty block space, let's say. Well, okay, now you can move some, some heavy computation that you still want to take place on chain, but it doesn't have to take place. Um, uh, it can take place perhaps in a, in a cheaper environment or in, in one that maybe has uh, uh, different, um, a, a different set of, of parameters that you're looking for. And all this can happen uh, in a way that abstracts the complexity uh, away from the end user and makes it easier. So they don't necessarily care which chain their message is, is ultimately going to. They care about having an enjoyable uh, experience and, and doing the, the action that they wanted to take. Um, and that uh, uh, complexity, the underlying infrastructural complexity, uh, can be abstracted away um, so that, you know, you can design your, your web app so you can check, uh, you know, the Axelar scan network and, and you can see, you know, exactly where the transaction uh, is. And then when it's confirmed on the destination chain, then you can update it, in, you know, in your, in your uh, UI. Okay, I do have uh, one more demo to share. And of course, we'll have time for, for questions. So if you can, uh, if you can think of any questions. Uh, Go ahead and put them in the chat. So for this um, uh, for this demo, oh presentation link. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, of, of course. Um, I'll share that uh, uh, just about in in five minutes if that's okay. Um, cool, cool. Um, so we can we can talk a little bit about the. Uh, uh, DAP structure of a, of a single chain uh, versus a multi-chain. I think you kind of saw some of the uh, examples on Prime Protocol, um, where Prime Protocol was, you know, politely asking me to to switch networks um, when it was appropriate. So it uh, a, a couple of design choices to keep in mind here. Uh, you do want to prompt the user, right? You can't assume that the user has all these chains already loaded in their MetaMask. So if they don't, you're going to have to ask them to add it. And it should be you know, a one-click button, just add network. Um, you should prompt them to switch you know, when it's appropriate to switch. And uh, as you saw, even though Prime is a testnet, um, that worked flawlessly. You know, I was never on the wrong network. Um, the diagram I'm showing here is about uh, a single chain. But a, a multi-chain DAP structure here is going to prompt the user to switch to the appropriate chain. Uh, and then it's going to you know, check the status of that message through something like Axelar scan, and it's going to update the front end, you know, based on the status uh, of the transaction. Okay, so for uh, the next part of the demo, sorry, I wanted to, to copy and paste that, but uh, I might just type it in: uh, Moonbeam multi-chain demo dot netlify. So I'm going to hang out here for a second, um, so that let me just paste the link in the chat. That might be easiest. 
We'll also paste the link for uh, my protocol so that people can get that too. Okay. So here uh, we have a front end uh, for sending a message from chain to chain. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Uh, Jeremy from the Moonbeam Developer Relations team built this. And let me just expand this a little bit. Okay, how's that? Cool. Uh, there's also, you can follow along with a, with a blog post. Um, you can do this yourself by deploying the respective contracts and, and sending the message uh, in Remix. But this is kind of a UI way to do it. So we can send uh, any message that we'd like. First note that I'm connected to MetaMask. I'm connected to Moonbase Alpha. Let's just double check. Yep. And we can say anything we want. So we can say, um, illuminate hackathon. And we can choose between two options here, uh, Axelar or Hyperlane. Uh, this is just for, for the, the demo purposes. So this is not to say that you can't send a message with Wormhole uh, or with Layer 0. You absolutely can. Uh, this is just not integrated in this particular testnet uh, uh, demo application. And we're going to be sending from Moonbase Alpha to, um, we'll pick another chain. Uh, we'll pick Avalanche in this case. So I chose Axelar. Uh, the message is going to be um, encoded as a payload, and then it's going to be uh, uh, decoded so that we can so we can uh, read it again. Let's go ahead and press submit. And you can't see the MetaMask pop up, but um, it's prompting us to uh, confirm a transaction. And the amount is a little bit higher uh, again because it has to pay for the fees uh, on the destination chain. And one of the things that's interesting, you know, within a, a testnet environment is that, uh, you know. In a mainnet environment, it's very easy to 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 know the appropriate amount of, of fees that you need to send, right? Because you can always uh, kind of see the gas price, and you can see kind of the the equivalency between networks. Uh, but with test nets, it's a little bit harder because it's like, okay, one dev, you know, what is that equal to, you know, in phantom test net tokens? It's like who knows. Um, so typically on a test net, we we overestimate, you know, quite a lot. So don't get don't get scared if you see a, a huge number and you're like, hey. I need to spend you know half a token for gas like that's so high. Well, it's because it's it's in a test net environment. So we can keep track of the status here, and uh, in terms of the presentation link, why don't I go ahead and get that while we're waiting? Or I will I will get that at the end. Uh, I'll return to the presentation link. Um, Sergey, were there any other links that I should send in the meantime? Um, before I send the presentation link. Okay, okay, cool. Um, okay, so we're waiting for this to execute. Um, another thing I can show you is you know, how do you look up your uh, transaction on Axelar Scan? You can just go to um, Axelar Scan. Uh, we'll go to testnet.axelarscan.io. You can just paste the transaction hash uh, from the first transaction that you make, so on the origin chain. Um, and Axelar will recognize this. And we can see exactly where we are. So um, in order to break down the status, uh, the transaction was successful on Moonbase. Uh, the gas was paid for. You know, it was enough. Uh, and then Axelar approved this call to be executed on the destination chain. So this whole process took about two minutes. Um, you know, that'll get faster over time. And uh, we can see a payload information. And if we were to go and decrypt this on the destination one or decode this, um, let's look at the transaction hash on the destination. Uh, we can see the input data, the payload is here. And if we were to view this, uh, we can see here that part of the message is eliminate hackathon, which is exactly uh, what we uh, expected. And there were other parts here. Uh, remember earlier I said that when you're making a cross-chain contract call, you need to specify you know, what um, you know, chain you want to interact with, you know, where you're coming from. Um, well, 
you need to specify what chain you want to interact with. So in this case, we can see where we're coming from. We can see we're coming from Moonbeam, and we can see the uh, uh, address of the contract that we want to interact with. Another thing, um, for Axlar, they always use the name of the mainnet when they're referring to testnet. So regardless of whether you're on Moonbase Alpha or Moonbeam, they use uh, the Moonbeam name. Okay, so this was successful. And now there's another part of the testnet uh, uh, of this DAP where we can read the message that we sent. So if we were to just say uh, Moonbase Alpha, um, Axelar, um, I think, let's see if I just switch to, I think that I'm actually cutting it off by being too far zoomed in. Let's see. Yeah, I think I just, something in the UI didn't update here, uh, but that's okay because we saw the message here that was sent. Um, and this is exactly what the what the DAP would be looking for. Okay, so um, back to the presentation. Uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and drop them in. Um, I do wanna kind of share next steps with you and, and where to go from here. So, um, for, for more of a background uh, on the philosophy of connected contracts and um, you know how you can uh, build with them, I'll go through all these links. So um, the first one is a Hello World contract with Axelar. So Jeremy built this. This is exactly what we just did here in the sample DAP, but you're going to be doing it by deploying your own contracts. Um, and you're going to be, uh, it's a very simple contract. It's send message, you're specifying a message, destination address, uh, destination chain, and a payload. Um, and you, you do that all yourself. Now you're going to specify the address on the destination chain. You're going to specify the gas, all that type of stuff. This is cool. It's hands-on. You know, I, I highly recommend checking that out. Um, there's also Axelar's SDK, which you can use. And uh, Jeremy has a blog post on uh, kind of the, the design philosophy of, of building a, a connected contract uh, DAP. So I would check that out too. Um, also, uh, for each of the GMP protocols, I wanted to compile a few links. Uh, so they they all have you know extensive uh, and wonderful documentation. And uh, for for you know you you typically need some of the same bits of information, right? You need to know how to send a message. Um, you'd love some example DApps. Um, you you need the contract addresses. And so for all these different GMP protocols, <clears throat> I've put. Where you can find them, you know, on the on the doc site or um, sometimes uh, the the Moonbeam site in this case. Um, but yeah, sending a message. This is the same one I just mentioned. Example DApps. Axlar has a bunch of uh, uh, five minute starter examples um, that you can do. You can do uh, minting tokens cross chain. You can send an NFT across the chain. Uh, they also have a, a two way example. Um, this is key depending upon the architecture, you know, of your of your DApp. If you just want to execute an action on a chain and all you need to know is was that successful or not, um, then you only need a one-way thing. Uh, but if you need a, a two-way message passing, let's say uh, you have a particular Oracle that's not yet available on Moonbeam, right? And let's say you want to call this particular Oracle on Ethereum. Uh, you can do that with Axlar. And in this case, you'd want to do a two-way round trip. You want to make a request for that and then you want to uh, get back the value, and you want to return that safely, you know, to to Moonbeam. That's one way that you could do, you could do it. And everybody always needs um, contracts. Oops, I think I put a uh, a video link here, but the contracts link is right around here. It should be under build, and then contract addresses. So I'll, I'll post a link here for that. Okay, moving right along. So for Hyperlane, uh, sending a message, uh, example dApps and contracts. I think one of these links was not yet updated, so I will update that immediately after. Uh, we have example dApps here. So for Hyperlane, you can build Hello World, uh, and you also have the contract addresses here. So I will be sure to to update that. Um, and of course, no, no contracts here. That's updated. It's just sending a message. I guess that was outdated. Um, we have the same examples for layer zero. So how to, how you can send a message. Let's check that out. Um, as you can see, 
you know, these GMP protocols uh, are, are similar and easy to use. So they're looking for the same amount of information. Maybe it's formatted a little bit differently. Maybe the uh, the way you send a message cross chain, that maybe there's slight slight differences, uh, but it's not difficult to use any of these protocols. And uh, you're not limited to using just one. Uh, Prime protocol, for instance, is going to be using two or more uh, different GMP protocols. So for reliability and robustness and uh, uh, having having a backup could be uh, you know a, a good architectural choice. Now, for a hackathon, we're not going to be worried if you if you just pick one and stick with one. That is perfectly fine. Um, you do not need to implement uh, multiple protocols uh, for your hackathon project. Now, of course, we have uh, uh, example dApps. Uh, we have contracts as well. You can see all the contract addresses here. And for wormhole, we have the same. So, how can you send a message? Oh yeah. Um, Alex is asking, I uh, just want to ask about support for layer zero and hyperlane. Oh, uh, support meaning like, um, uh, do you want like, like office hour support you're saying, or like, um, you have like questions about like how to, how to work with layer zero and hyperlane. So layer zero and hyperlane um, are both uh, supported with Moonbeam, and uh, they each connect, you know, to a variety of, of different chains. And uh, they're both sponsoring, you know, uh, big bounties uh, for the for the hackathon. Let me let me put the bounties here in as well in the link. Oh, from the uh, from the XCM SDK. Oh, oh, I see, I see. So from from Moonbeam's. Uh, uh, for Moonbeam's XEM SDK, that's separate from the Axelar SDK. And then uh, do they have their own SDK, uh, you're saying? Um, I believe that, uh, if I can just get to the right uh, place, uh, there are uh, SDKs. So let me just get to the right place. So Wormhole has a Git book. Uh, so layer zero has an SDK. Okay, coming soon. Okay, uh, so the, uh, there we go. Uh, I think let's check for Hyperlane. Pretty sure Hyperlane does have uh, an SDK. Um, I know their their docs are uh, in progress here, so so things are are being uh, updated, um, and also for um, the presentation that York Rhodes gave yesterday. Uh, I believe he touched on this at the end, um, and he, he said he, that the the docs would be updating, uh, that he would be updating the docs very very shortly. Um, also, if you just want to jump into our uh, Discord, discord.gg/moonbeam, and we can post updates uh, there. Let me post that, and I'm going to post a a link to the presentation. Uh, right now actually uh let me just pull that up Oops. okay one second so let me make a copy and thank you so much for joining um Thank you, Alex, Sergey, um, and everybody else on the call. We will put a, a replay up for this uh, and the other ones. <clears throat> okay, so making this uh, anybody can view. Okay, here it is. Here's the link. Um, cool, cool. And yeah, that's. Uh, that brings us to to a close. Um, next uh, Monday, we'll have the Axelar uh, presentation followed by the um, <clears throat> followed by the Layer Zero presentation. We'll have office hours next week. Uh, Jeremy and I will have them, and then the following week we'll have uh, office hours by each of the uh, GMP sponsors. 
Thank you so much, Kevin, for uh, going through this. This was awesome. Uh, I think a lot of people got some clarity or a little bit more clarity from this. Uh, one of the questions that we had on YouTube was if there was going to be any uh, any videos regarding like smart contract auditing or zero knowledge proofs or anything like that during this uh, hackathon. And I didn't think there were so far uh, scheduled, but I wasn't sure if you had any insight into that. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we don't have anything planned uh, for that, but there are tons of resources, um, you know, out there for um, that type of uh, Solidity smart contract uh, auditing um, and also for uh, zero knowledge proofs. There's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a podcast called the zero knowledge podcast. Um, I know they cover like a lot of stuff there, but um, I would recommend that resource. And then in terms of uh, auditing, um, I think Open Zeppelin, you know, has some resources. A lot of, uh, okay, uh, my my recommendation here, um, okay, uh, two two steps. One is um, capture the ether, which is uh, that's uh, like a bit more of like a, a basic security resource, right? It's a game uh, where you can uh, <clears throat> find problems in in Solidity smart contracts. So that's a, a bit more of like an introductory thing. Uh, and then the second thing is, if you want to get more advanced. You can read through bug reports of you know famous like hacks and figure out what went wrong, and uh, see if you can kind of like replicate those issues yourself. Yeah, I think uh, my favorite uh, approach is always to like follow Sam when Sam announces any type of hack that's gone through, and then his whole procedure of like replicating it and where the vulnerability is, and just trying to re emulate that. I think it's really great um, knowledge, just in general, it will make you a better smart. Uh, contract um, writer, you know, a smart contract um, engineer, um, just by reading it and where the vulnerabilities are and what we need to look out for. And I think it's something that we should, you know, be doing if we're going to be writing smart contracts uh, and so it'll be like that too. It's a responsibility of us all to be really uh, making sure that our contracts are as sound as possible. Uh, with that, I will wrap up this session. Thank you so much, those who are watching here on Airme and those who are watching on YouTube. As I uh, said earlier, you can always rewatch the session on our YouTube channel. Uh, the whole playlist is there and we'll be sharing it in the Discord as well. Uh, thank you again, Kevin, I appreciate it. And then I know we have some more um, sessions coming up next week uh, as well. So, you know, we'll be here at the same bat channel. I think it's actually gonna be at like uh, 1800 UTC next time. So um, we'll see you all then. All right, Thanks everyone. So much. Bye, Kevin.